we're very glad to have two speakers with us and coming from Hillsborough County. So I will introduce the first presenter, which is um, Miss Abigail Flores, and she's a licensed PE, both in Florida and California, and he has more than 20 years of professional experience in the public sector, including engineering design, project management, traffic investigation, multimodal network planning, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, uh, I think both of our speakers has lots of accomplishments and lots of certifications. So if you see their signature on the emails after the name, there's a PE, there's other acronyms of the certification that they obtain. I will not go through all of them. I think you can um, read their uh, introduction or short bio on our website. So if you search for uh, USF Carter Seminar, then you click on March 3rd day, you will find that. And our second speaker will be uh, Brian Gentry, and uh, he's a senior professional uh, traffic management engineer for Hillsborough County. And before, actually, he worked for, um, oh, he, he actually taking care of both the Hillsborough County Traffic Management Center, TMC, and also Advanced Traffic Management System called ATMS. Um, and he has worked in traffic operation for about 17 years and uh, uh, previously worked at District 7 office, uh, trans transportation management and operations, and also the city of Tampa TMC. So he worked both as engineer at the District 7 and also the manager for the city of Tampa TMC. Okay, so we already delayed because of some issue at the beginning. So with further ado, I'll just give the floor to our presenters. All right, I uh, look forward to your presentation. Thank you for being here. All righty. Good afternoon, USF students. I'm glad to be with you today. Thanks for spending your lunch with me. My name is Abigail Flores. I'm the Safety and Mobility Program Manager for the unincorporated Hillsborough County. And today I would like to share with you some great information and opportunities. Today's agenda, I'm gonna to talk to you about why we do what we do at Hillsborough County, how we do it, and I'm gonna share a call to action. So who we are. So safety and mobility is part of the engineering and operations division, excuse me, department, and the technical services division and the transportation services section. Our team is our Assistant County Administrator, Kimberly Beyer, our Director, Josh Bellotti, Leland Dykus, a Director, and Robert Campbell, my Supervisor, and on my team is Michael Miller. So let's talk about why we do, why should we do transportation, guys? Well, here's some that we, here's something, some things that we support at Hillsborough County, and that's everyone should be able to use the transportation system to get back home to their loved ones. Does anybody disagree with that? That's pretty reasonable, right guys? Great. Everyone should have access to employment, education, services, and recreation by their mode of choice. So that means walking, biking, scooting, driving, transit, and any other way you wanna to get to where you need to go. We want the transportation system to be intuitive and user-friendly for all ages and abilities. That means a new driver starting to use the transportation system should be able to interpret it. And my 72-year-old 70, dad should be able to use it. It should be friendly. And lastly, that transportation is a public good that should provide equal dignity and access for all users. Let's talk about safety culture. So in Hillsborough County, we have a safety culture. And I have listed some of the items here that uh, are included in our safety culture is that we have been named, our metro area, which includes adjacent counties, have been named the number four most deadly metro area in the US. And that was uh, from a dangerous by design annual publication that comes out every year. We have 1,100 people are maimed or die annually on our transportation system in the unincorporated Hillsborough County. Pet and bicyclists are 25% of fatal and severe injury crashes despite being less than 1% of the roadway users out there. 75% of our road, 
roadways have posted speed limits are of 40 and above, which is where the fatal and severe injury crashes happen on these posted speeds, 40 and above. We have large intersections and long signal timing cycles. So this is part of our safety culture is the beliefs, the values, and the behaviors of a group of people. So living here, we, we share common beliefs, common values, and we exhibit common behaviors using the transportation system. Does anybody recognize this intersection? Yeah, how many of you guys cross this daily? Yeah, so this is an example of our design culture here in Hillsborough County, which is a lot of people in the room are going to be working on this in the near future, designing roadways. And so we see multi-lane, right? And we see vulnerable roadway users, pedestrians, scooters. We see uh, aggressive driving here, encroaching the driver encroaching onto the right-of-way of the scooter. So we see here that, yeah, the number one traffic violation is failure to yield right-of-way. So that means that uh, part of our culture is I need to go. Right, you you go second, and I I need the right of way. So that's these are all data driven. So all of these points, uh, we have analyzed the data. We analyze the crash port reports, and we've other data that's available to us to determine what our traffic safety culture is. And also, we have 88,000 transit dependent residents in Hillsborough County. So that means they depend on transit to get to work and places they need to go. And finally the lack of access to schools and parks and outdoors by walking and bicycling. So how do I know this? Well, I manage the Safe Routes to School program and through our engineering analysis, we have found that there's gaps, right? And substandard uh, routes to get to school if you wanna walk or bike. And also the parents in our parent surveys have indicated that there's barriers to walking and biking for their student to school. Uh, our safety and mobility goals are listed here. We want to eliminate fatal and severe injury crashes. So this is very doable. So we're not trying to eliminate all crashes, just the ones that cause fatal and severe crash, fatal and severe injuries. We want to engineer self-enforcing roads that are forgiving when humans make mistakes. So that means the road is intuitive. It tells me, hey, slow down, there's a curve ahead. Or hey, expect vulnerable roadway users on this street. We want to design complete streets to support the uses people want. So that's a concept in our industry also, is complete streets, that the street should be complete and provide for the travel that the people on that street want, right? So we have different complete streets. So in a commercial area, the complete street would be accommodating trucks, semi-trucks, right? Their turns and their movements that they need. But in an urban center, the complete street is, hey, we need wide sidewalks and we need mid-block crossings, for example. And lastly, we wanna provide infrastructure where it is needed most in underserved communities. So underserved communities are historically have had lack of investment of transportation infrastructure. So we're trying to put infrastructure where it's most needed there. Okay, how we do these great things, our goals is we have collaboration with our partners like the Transportation Planning Organization, the TPO. Uh, I will share how we coordinate with them. Also the uh, FDOT, Florida Department of Transportation. We are also partnering with nonprofits like Cutter and Sidewalk Stompers to accomplish our goals. Uh, so we have committed to vision zero. That means eliminating fatal and severe injuries in our region. Hillsborough County, we have committed to eliminating fatal severe injuries, crashes through our safe systems approach. So this is the multi-prong approach to achieving zero fatal and severe injury crashes. And as engineers, what's under our purview is the safe roads and the safe speeds. So we wanna design safe roads and posted speed limits that support getting home to your families after you use the system. And lastly, the complete streets guide which was recently um, uh, accepted by the Hillsborough County. And the Complete Streets Guide show us what streets should look like. So it shows us how many lanes based on context classification. Context means suburban, commercial, urban. So based on what's happening there um, on the street, we have identified if the bicycle facility should be on the street or off the street. Should it be a shared use path? 
And for example, continuing on and how do we do it is that safety and program safety and mobility programs that I oversee, and they include safety programs, mobility programs, and reporting programs. So under safety, we're trying to address the crashes here. And so we have a high injury corridor safety program, which retrofits our high injury network, a speed management program, unsignalized intersection program, and a lane departure retrofit program. Under mobility here, we're trying to improve the network to encourage walking and biking, and it includes ped corridor safety and access retrofit. So retrofitting the corridor so that you can walk and cross mid block and at strategic locations. Uh, we also have the bicycle corridor network program, safe routes to school program, and heart transit safety and access, where we try to in, uh, improve access to transit. And finally, I oversee our annual reporting, which if you email me, I can send you a copy of that report. It includes more description of the programs that we have. Hey, uh, this is our program flow. So I shared that we have 10 programs. And so each program goes through this process here. And we start with a methodology screening and ranking, which I will go into. We move on. Once we have ranked locations for a program, we move on to project development, developing projects at those locations. Then we move on to tier one design and construction. This just means a quick implementation, something we can get in the ground um, within three months or so, like pave, pavement markings and signage. And then we move on to tier two design and construction. This is your capital improvement project, which would takes one year to design and then the next year it goes into construction and our post project evaluation so that we can see, did we lower driver operating speeds? Did we reduce crashes? Is there more biking and walking on the corridor? This is a program methodology for that each program has where we identify the risk factors. Okay, and that includes the risk factors to the people who are using the roadway. So it, it means uh, past crashes that have happened, fatal and severe, uh, missing and subpar infrastructure, so your sidewalk gaps and your lack of bike lanes, for example. Uh, posted speeds, so higher posted speeds are higher risk, and then higher driver volumes are higher risk. And roadway geometry, is it wide? Then that's a higher risk, right? multi-lane roadways, higher risk. Then we have exposure factors. So that means, um, are there a, a lot of vulnerable users on at this location, on the corridor? A lot of pet and bike. Um, is there a lot of destinations that people wanna go there, like a university or a mall? Equity, is it an underserved community that needs the investment? And context classification, is it urban? Is it suburban, commercial? So we, we invest in projects when we have high risk and high exposure, right? That is what gets the location ranked higher in the program. Uh, once we have the rankings of the locations based on the methodology, we move on to the project flow. We're engineers, we create projects. So it, it looks like this. We start with GIS analysis. GIS is very important, very powerful. Everything that I'm showing you in the maps has been created with GIS analysis. So this shows us the red segments, the colored segments is where students are walking. This is from a Safe Routes to School project. And the circles, the red circles are where crosswalks are um, planned to go in. And this is really powerful. We look at the crashes, for example. Then we set the project limits. So we say we're going to go half a mile down this corridor this way and half a mile that way, and this is our project limits. Then we send engineers into the field to do a field review and where they observe human behavior. So our industry is moving more and more towards trying to address behaviors, right, with infrastructure. Um, then we... After the behaviors, we move into, the engineers are there, they're observing behaviors, and they're identifying what improvements should go there. Should we have a raised crosswalk? Do we need a mid-block crosswalk, wider sidewalks? We need a bike lane. So once we uh, look at the project feasibility, we move into design. So does anybody have an idea of what, what would go into project feasibility? 
Any hands? So we, we're, we're trying to study how difficult is it going to be to implement this project. So we look at, oh, there's utility conflict where I want to put a sidewalk, right? So that means it's going, it's higher complexity, so more challenging to implement. Or there's drainage right here where I want to put an improvement, like a sidewalk. So that means you'd have to pipe that drainage. So the cost goes up, right? And somebody's got to design that drainage. So we're trying to identify that early on in the project process is the project feasibility. Then we move on to design and construction. This is an example of the, um, the tier one quick implementation plan where we use delineators to create the ped refuge and we put a high visibility crosswalk and some signage there. And this is an example of what it looks like when it's constructed. Right, so I wanna share, talk to you about the programs that I manage for Hillsborough County, and we have the Safe Routes to School program where we engage, we talked about collaboration, we engage the principal, the PTA members, they become part of our project advisory committee and other neighboring um, jurisdictions. If the students are walking on their roadways, they're included in our advisory committee like FDOT. <clears throat> so we get together and after the engineers have identified the improvements um, and identify the behaviors, we meet with the project advisory committee, the PAC, and we share with them our recommendations to get their feedback, to have transparency, and to make sure that we don't have any blind spots because they always give us a lot of useful information that we use in project development. Here we have King High School students. This is an example of a behavior that we observed during our engineering field review where the students are riding on the sidewalk uh, posted speed limit is 45, so this is the safest place to be for students, but it's narrow, so we've identified a need for wider sidewalks so you can walk and bike. Then we have here walking uh, students walking to elementary school with a narrow sidewalk. <clears throat> this sign is uh, in the way, and then it's adjacent to the travel lane. So these are conditions that we're trying to address through uh, projects in this program. This is a toolbox. So what's great about every, sing every program that we have has a toolbox. These are the building blocks of our projects. So this is what you can expect to see for quick implementation. This is what you can expect to see in our capital improvements projects like rectangular rapid flashing beacons, for example, and chicanes. Over here is an implemented Safe Routes of School project with the high visibility and the signage. The bicycle network program. So this was Reese. Sure, let's ask some questions. Yeah, so the tier one is quickly implementable. So the same year that we do project development, we put these kind of treatments in the ground because we have these materials in the warehouse and we can put those quickly. These require design, right? The RFB needs a foundation and the raised crosswalk impacts drainage. So these are longer term in the future improvements. Okay, so we, we this is a collaborate, this program is a collaboration with the TPO, Transportation Planning Organization. And what we did is we did a methodology that evaluated the risk and exposure and network quality of the bicycle network. So that's how we got this map. And the red means higher program score, which means higher risk and exposure. And the green means lower program, program score, so lower risk and exposure. So this is the urban service area here, which means it's more dense development. So this is where the majority of people live in Hillsborough County here. And those balloons are the locations that are under project development right now. I want to, this is what our plans look like. So these are how we implement projects. This is an alternative, this is a concept plan. So you can see that the bike lanes are identified off of the street because it's multi-lane. Recall that we want comfortable facilities that people are gonna use, so that's why they're off the street. This is an example of, I mentioned, it's challenging to get to parks via biking and walking. So this is a route to a park and uh, you have to travel in the street if you wanna ride by bike. This is another example of what the kind of conditions my team is addressing in this program where the bike lane uh, stops at the intersection and then you're uh, merging with traffic there. So we want to improve these type of facilities. 
Okay, the High Injury Network Safety Program. So this is the Vision Zero High Injury Network map. And the blue lines here, the green lines, are our Vision Zero corridors. And then the red heat map is the high concentration of fatal and severe crashes. So you can see they line up very well. This, this map was done in GIS. Um, and then all, you also see, see how it's, again, it's in the urban service area where there's um, high volume, right? It goes back to the risk factors that I shared. This is a recently implemented uh, high injury network project on Mango Road. So we put delineators to put a barrier between the sidewalk and the travel lane. And then we did these bulb outs with delineators. This is very effective. A lot of the ped crashes happen at the intersection. That's where the conflict point is, right? Conflict points, a lot of them. And so uh, putting this in makes drivers making a right turn slow down. And it also makes the ped more visible and reduces the exposure of the crossing distance because now you're uh, here. This is a drawing, an engineering drawing for Lynn Turner where we're gonna implement these green plates right here are actually um, reflective yellow uh, taping that goes around the signal head to make it easier to identify. For drivers, we have other treatments there. Okay, the speed management efforts. So this is really state of, this is really ahead of the curve here in Hillsborough County. We are leaders in safety and with this, effort, this program that I'm managing, we have identified tools. We've created tools that identify the safe speeds for, for the corridor. As I met, remember, you remember safe systems approach means safe posted speed limits. Well, we've created tools and this is a, a float part of the flow chart that the tool follows where uh, the user of the tool inputs what is the context. And then um, you're able to come down the the flow chart and get a target speed. So these are all part of the complete streets and that's how we've been implementing the complete streets to arrive at uh, our target speeds based on the characteristics of the corridor. Here we have a map here of posted speed and fatal and severe crashes. So high, so sp speed is a major factor in fatal and severe crashes. We've all taken physics and we know that the faster something's traveling, the, the, the greater magnitude of force, right? So that's what causes the fatal and severe. It's a major factor. And you can see that the posted speed limits of 40 or greater are in black. And there's uh, a lot of those in the high crash concentration, which is also in red. Okay, this is also a state-of-the-art program. It's our unsignalized intersection safety program. So the genesis of our programs is when we do data analysis of the system, we find out uh, the challenges and then we launch a program to address that challenge. So this program is because the number one crash type in Hillsborough County is a uh, angle crash. So that's when at an intersection, uh, driver on driver collide at a right angle. And so what we did is we studied over 5,000 unsignalized intersections. So there's no way we could have, could have done that without GIS. So you see how powerful it is. Then we were able to rank the intersections using the methodology. And then we looked at the top 150 and we found that in the top 150, there was reoccurring intersection types. And this is one of them, which is a four lane undivided roadway here intersecting with a two lane undivided. So this is a major uh, violator of safety in Hillsborough County. It's, it's um, one of the ones we want to address proactively and systemically. So you'll hear that term in our industry and it means we want to apply it wherever it applies. So it, you don't have to meet a minimum crash hold. We've already done the analysis. We've identified there's a major problem because it repeats in the top 150. So we wanna deploy quick implementation like stop signs and high visibility crosswalks, for example. And this is part of the logic or the flow that uh, we use to in our methodology. Getting the word out about safety. So that's something very important as leaders in safety and mobility. Um, we want to report on the great work we're doing. So we do that in our annual report that talks about our, a lot of the information I've shared here, as well as details about our program. 
And then I often go and speak about safety and share about our programs. So in our ITE annual um, conference, we will be uh, have a poster session on our speed management tools. So if you guys uh, are in the neighborhood, stop by and see us at the national ITE meeting. And here is the great thing about sharing what we're doing about safety is we get funding. We get money to do these safety projects. So recently we got $20 million from the federal government to do over 20 projects for the PED corridor, the bike network, and safe access to transit, as well as a higher injury network. Some of the key performance indicators that we keep track of is our design projects. So you can see that the quick implementation design, we are more than doubled from last year, as well as the construction of quick implementation. So these are going in and the communities uh, are experiencing the increased safety and visibility of uh, vulnerable users right away. And we are doing six capital improvement designs this year. And our budget has, al has also been going up, so that's great. So in summary, why we do what we do, come on guys, we want everyone to be able to use a transportation system and get back home to their loved ones. No bad news. We want everyone to have access to opportunities in their mode of choice. And the transportation system should be intuitive and user-friendly for all ages and abilities. How we do it? Well, we have the transportation programs. We have a commitment to Vision Zero that fatal and severes are unacceptable and we will eliminate them. We are committed to safe road designs and safe posted speed limits, to using complete streets that reflect what users need at, on that corridor, to prioritize underserved communities, and to perform community engagement and stakeholder collaboration. The last thing is a call to action. Now is the time. So if you use that scanner, you will see that we have an opportunity for an EI. So I encourage everybody to check it out. Um, and um, contact me if you have any more questions. Thank you. We can do it uh, later. Let's hold the questions so Brian can get going. That would be good. Ready, Brian? Guys, we're going to hold questions till the end. Thank you. Thanks, Abigail. Um, thanks for having me. My name is Brian Gentry. I'm the traffic management um, center manager, um, for lack of a better term, for Hillsborough County. I've been in the industry almost 20 years, and I graduated uh, USF 2005 with a chemical engineering degree and thought to myself I would do anything but traffic. It just seemed so boring. I didn't really know anything about it, and um, <clears throat> it's actually very exciting and truly rewarding, too, when you can uh, monitor and manage traffic, mitigate that traffic to reduce secondary crashes and get people around the congestion. I um, actually brought a book that I just bought, and Abigail will get a kick out of this. Um, she mentioned human behavior and traffic safety. safety. It's a 1,200-page textbook that I just bought. Um, this is what I do for fun on my off time. But uh, anyway, so I'm just going to go over a general um, what we do in Hillsborough County traffic management and um, hopefully have some time for questions later on. I know we also are going to be hosting some of uh, Cutter at the brand new traffic management center um, that we just uh, moved into for Hillsborough County next Thursday. So uh, that's going to be a great opportunity to actually see the team in action and um, see them utilize the resources that we provided to them to uh, manage traffic for Hillsborough County. So we've got a five-year plan. Um, the acronym is OPERATE, Optimize, Preserve, Expand, Respond, Advise, Train, and Equip. So I came on with Hillsborough County about five years ago and began um, building the program. So use the uh, transportation systems management and operations capability maturity model to guide the program with the business processes, performance measurement, organization collaboration, et cetera. 
So um, real quick uh, before we get into, and I'm going to try and not get too technical or use too many acronyms, but um, basically what we do is, uh, like I said, monitor and manage traffic. We do this basically with the two um, uh, largest systems that we utilize is the traffic uh, central traffic signal system, which communicates these black dots represent the uh, traffic signals within Hillsborough County. And uh, through that system, also utilizing our video management system, uh, the CCTV cameras, we're able to um, monitor, verify crashes, and um, modify the central traffic signal system to, um, to help with the uh, drivers around the congestion. So this is uh, a little bit uh, outdated. We actually have 572 signals currently. We're constantly adding signals. Um, the traffic signal system is a very large and distributed network, as you can see. And it basically consists of the traffic management center, where we have all of our servers, um, firewalls, workstations, video management software, et cetera. And um, it's connected to the traffic signals by a large uh, telecommunications network uh, compromising several uh, different technologies. Um, you get work your way to the actual intersection, and that is where the cabinet is, the controller, cameras, detection, et cetera. And we do this, obviously, for uh, road users while utilizing some uh, different softwares and programs. This is a, a picture of the brand new TMC. This is where we work. Uh, there's currently a, a team of six, got some um, graphics of different equipment. And um, here you see the, the central software, modify the signal timings, reduce congestion. Um, and you can see the different uh, cameras that we have there. So the, the primary, uh, the core service that we provide is um, again, manage that traffic, reduce secondary crashes to improve safety and uh, help route traffic around crashes. Um, we also, there's other non-recurring congestion such as construction, right? We might have a water main break, closes the road. In fact, two days ago, I believe, uh, Dale Mabry just north of I-275 was closed. Someone was doing a directional bore on the west side of the road and hit a gas line. So they had to close down the road um, for several hours. And um, that's actually a part of uh, City of Tampa's signal system. So they managed that incident. OK, so we have uh, core services again. Uh, let's skip this. Sorry, too detailed. So here's um, some examples of the communication network, how many signals out of the total 570 are, you can see 55 are not communicating. There is no infrastructure to them. These are usually on the outskirts of the system. But um, th we would like to get everything on fiber. Obviously, we're bringing a lot of uh, intensive data over the network in the form of video. So um, to have a reliable fiber optic uh, backbone is key. It's a part of the advanced traffic management system which is one of our initiatives to upgrade the entire system and um, provide for better communications. Colors indicate different types of the communications. So obviously, like I said, the fiber is ideal, um, but we do utilize other technologies um, so that we can get communications to the signal without imposing too much of a cost either on the citizens or even developers. If we've got line of sight and it's quarter mile from um, uh, an intersection that is communicating via fiber optic cable, then we can throw a radio in there and um, communicate with that intersection that way at, at a much uh, cheaper cost. Showing the difference between the current network and what it's going to look like um, when we're done. And the main goal here is we want to provide for a robust and redundant communications, right? So if I've got a contractor out on the road and he's digging and rips up the fiber optic cable, I'm going to lose communications. Making uh, these connections here 
and making it redundant. If this is hit, I can still communicate with this signal because it's going to come back the other way. Let's skip this, please. OK, so uh, here's uh, some examples of cabinets and controllers. Um, this is a pole mounted cabinet. We don't see that too often. This is the new TS2 cabinet that uh, is our new spec. And you see the legacy controller compared to a new advanced traffic controller. And um, I came close to bringing in. I have a small uh, controller from 50 or 60 years ago. It's a small um, uh, mechanical device with three parameters. You, got, you have on and off, and then there is a cycle, offset, and split. Those are the basic three parameters that we utilize to, um, to move traffic. So you want a corridor to have the same cycle length, and the offset would just be if the first one is at zero, distance equals rate times time, however long it's going to take you to get there when you get to the next signal, I want you to get the green. If that's going to be 13 seconds, that offset would be 13, and so on down the road. And then uh, the split is the amount of time you're given each movement, right? So, and, and that's a direct function of volume. So um, this new ATC controller, like I said, the uh, 50 years ago controller had about three parameters, and now there are tens of thousands parameters in that controller. So we can now um, do cool things like leading pedestrian intervals and um, program overlaps, emergency vehicle preemption, which I'll get, which I'll get into a little bit later, um, et cetera, some uh, transit signal priority. So there's a, there's a lot that can be programmed in a controller now. And just a quick graphic to illustrate the difference between a legacy controller and the new ATC, something that uh, well, you guys probably don't even remember a rotary phone. Um, but again, rotary phone compared to an iPhone, an old cathode ray tube television compared to a flat TV. Um, very similar you know, technology, obviously, always increasing. And uh, after being stagnant for a while in this industry, it's very, very cool. There's a lot of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, lots of different technologies coming around. So it's, uh, it's very exciting. And the evolution of a controller. Actually, um, this is similar to the one that I was going to bring in, but uh, you can see over the years it's gone electromechanical all the way to uh, uh, electronic, developing standards. Um, Go ahead. Just showing the uh, legacy cabinets and controllers. The, the blue dots over here are the new ATCs, uh, which I'll speak about um, quickly on, on why that's important. Um, so an advanced traffic controller communicates with the central system 10 times each second. So we know exactly what the controller is doing. It's uh, storing that in the controller and packets, sends it to the central system every once in a while. And with that data, along with uh, advanced de vehicle detection, so we have typical vehicle detection, which uh, used to be um, loops cut in the pavement. You would see that. And um, now we're, our spec is a non-intrusive radar detection. We also use video detection. Um, really just kind of depends on the needs, right? Each intersection is, uh, is dynamic and different. But with the advanced detection and the ATCs, we can now get automated traffic signal performance measures. So historically, uh, retiming corridors or traffic signals in general, FHWA suggested between three and five years, you need to retime a signal. So, you know, I've been doing this for a while. I've seen signals that operate for 10 years with no problem and you can retime uh, a traffic signal and something may happen you know uh, in the area with the development um, etc to where you may need to retime that again much sooner than three to five years so it's actually one of our um, goals to develop a new methodology for retiming signals based on this data that we're receiving which the uh, signal performance measures consist of the number of cars arriving on green, arriving on red, uh, red light running, um, phase terminations, et cetera, um, 
let me expound on this a little bit. This shows the detection. And this is typical stop line detection and it's advanced detection around 350, 400 feet from the intersection. And this allows us to uh, understand uh, exactly what the cars are doing, not just if there is a vehicle present at the intersection or not. Um, and we utilize uh, ITERIS's clear guide as one of our tools here. And this is um, an example of some of the signal performance measures that you can get. Um, this is percent arrivals on green. So, you know, very important. Um, we can get alerts, we program it to get alerts. If we've got a large number of vehicles arriving on red, that's not a great thing. Okay, so uh, the dilemma zone is basically the space where you have a dilemma. You're, if you're approaching a traffic signal and you're far enough away, when it goes from green to yellow, you have ample time to stop. Um, if you are so close to the intersection at a speed that it goes green to yellow, you obviously cannot stop. You proceed through the intersection and then the uh, traffic signal will turn red. The dilemma zone is that spot where the driver's not real sure. Should I go? Should I stop? Um, so having that detection there, um, it's a future initiative, but uh, we'd also like to extend the red in those cases. So if it were at that point, you just extend the all red for the entire intersection for a second or two to um, improve safety. This is just an example of um, pavement, right? It deteriorates uh, in Florida. It flexes a lot with the heat and contracts, and it will break those uh, inductive loops. So, um, and there's other advantages as well to going to uh, non-intrusive detection. Obviously, you'll be able to maintain detection better, but uh, also for construction when there's phasing, they change lanes, uh, lanes. And um, if we have video or radar, we can just reprogram that for the new configuration. Whereas if you have loops, obviously um, you can't do that so easily. Just an example of the uh, Wavetronics um, HD sensor that we're using for detection. And some examples of um, images of traffic that we've managed recently. Um, these are, this is real life uh, captures that my team has uh, taken. And, and I've mentioned this, but again, this is our basic core service. See the car on its side over here. Uh, HCSO has closed this. And obviously that's gonna impact other surrounding intersections. The volume at those intersections are going to increase and uh, probably get over capacity. So being able to identify that quickly and start modifying traffic signals is, uh, is of great importance. And it's not just crashes. You know, I said crashes in construction. That's our typical non-recurring uh, congestion. But um, we worked with HCSO to help with uh, protests. Um, we've had shootings. Um, fires where the smoke has limited visibility. And we've actually had a helicopter fall out of the sky onto US-41, um, which, as you can imagine, um, caused huge traffic issues. Interesting. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the presentation uh, I meant to give. But um, anyways, definitely like to uh, open it up for questions and garner some in interest. You know, Abigail was talking about that. We have a couple of positions in the Traffic Management Center, and um, we'd love to have you guys come out and see it. It's, it's uh, super cool, very fun, and uh, rewarding.
Um, yes, there is for sure. Um, and almost all the technology coming out um, now has some um, indications of AI. Um, one that I can come up off the top of my head um, was an initiative I tried to implement and was not successful, but the company is called uh, Waycare. City of Tampa actually utilizes it. And um, they are just ingesting all the data they can to what they call predict crashes, right? And obviously we don't know where a crash is going to happen, but if it just started raining, it's 5 p.m., it's a weekday, um, you're near the Raymond James Stadium and there's an event, so the volume's gonna be up, it'll start calculating where you might want to uh, start paying attention. So there's an example. We just didn't end up pursuing it at the county. Um, a couple of different things, resources for sure, personnel um, initiatives. We, it's a very large program, um, but we're very young as well. So we've just got a lot going on. Um, currently, we don't, we're going to be hiring for an operator uh, very soon, but currently um, we only have a team of six. So everyone on the team uh, wears many hats and tries to fill those positions as well as develop mm -hmm. the program and all the different initiatives while, you know, doing the core service of managing traffic. Okay, sure. All right, do we have any questions from... Let's use the mic. Uh, are you working uh, now on uh, are you, any full, uh, fully actuated adaptive controller? Fully actuated yeah. intelligence? Yes. Not sure I understand the question, sorry. The traffic control the intersections, mm -hmm. do we have now, or do you have like uh, the adaptive ones or not yet? Smart ones, smart intersections. Yes, well, there's, um, if I understand correctly, we have a lot of different intelligent transportation uh, system, what we call ITS devices. Um, cameras, again, uh, the advanced controllers and detection. Um, we have a project currently that we're doing in conjunction with fire rescue. So emergency vehicle preemption, um, along with priority that also has a connected vehicle component. And so these locations, it's actually, we started on Big Ben with a proof of concept and we've been moving north uh, up 301. So as we get these implemented over the next couple of months, um, it's actually going to be communicating um, connected vehicle information, specifically uh, signal phasing and timing, uh, SPAT data, and basic safety messages, VSM, emergency vehicle behind you, uh, et cetera, that you can get from the app. And uh, eventually it would just go to the infotainment to the car. I think I tried to understand his question. I think actuated signals, there are many in the network that branch you. How about adaptive? Do you collect the information in real time and come up with some traffic management, real time traffic management solutions? It's on a, a future plan for adaptive systems. We don't have currently any adaptive systems, mm -hmm. but all signals are actuated in Hillsborough County. City of Tampa, downtown, they have some pre time signals where they're not actuated, but mm -hmm. Hillsborough County does not. Okay, great. Um, I think before I go over the questions online for the online audience, I have do have questions for um, Abigail. So remember, you uh, showed kind of one um, intersection that kind of had high crash rates. So I was wondering, is that more for like left turn vehicles hit kind of the cross through traffic or the right turn is what are the specific crash types for those type of intersections? Yeah, so at the unsignalized intersection, mainly we're seeing uh, driver on driver right angle. So somebody trying to enter the intersection gets struck by somebody with a through movement. Mm -hmm. But we also have seen pet and bike crashes where uh, they're trying to get across the intersection and they're struck by a driver as well. So that's what we're seeing. So for the cross, for their angles, is that they intended to turn left or turn right? Yeah, they're trying to um, 
cross if we can we pull up that slide they're trying to cross the, the from the minor they're coming on to the major trying to make a through movement uh, or a left turn and they're getting struck by the through traffic okay i see yeah so these guys are coming out here and either trying to turn or go straight and these so this direction's uh, mm -hmm. causing the crash so basically the judgment of the gap, long enough gap for them to make the movement is... Right, and then so you see here, we want to remove any vegetation. So we, we care about sight distance. Right. And then uh, we want to you know put the new pavement markings in so they know where to position themselves. Okay, great, thank you. All right, we have more questions from online audience. Uh, from Sarah, she asks, motorists seem to learn the signal timing, so they are more daring to accelerate on yellow and even run a red light. Might there be a way to use signal timing, make the faces and timing less predictable to get motorists to decide to slow and stop? Good question. Definitely, um, there is. We've, we've considered um, programming some of the signals to be uncoordinated. Um, to to try and prevent that, as I mentioned before, we would like to try and potentially extend the red when that happens. I think that's a, a better um, way of mitigating that behavior. Um, ultimately, that uh, I would suggest that that's an enforcement issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, more questions for Brian. <laughs> Brian, do you have a traffic database unit existing in the private traffic data, or is that part of the clear guide? We do. Um, that is part of clear guide. Clear guide utilizes um, probe data here and uh, and RITIS data. Um, so yes, both, and it is a part of clear guide. Mm -hmm. I think after that, it comment on the screen. Uh, Ken Sides mentioned clear water actually has had adaptive signal timing for more than 15 years. And the next question is for Abigail. Is there any current planning efforts for autonomous transit corridor in Hillsborough County? So we um, do not at this time, but we have identified transit corridors. Mm -hmm. And so we have a bike level of service and a ped level of service of B as in boy or better on these transit corridors. So we are focused, they are on our radars. We're trying to improve them for transit access and for safety. But some of Ryan, some of Brian's technologies do have the capability of uh, making transit more efficient on those corridors. Can we right. give the signal priority to the transit? Are you doing that right now? We do. Um, a, a Fletcher, I believe, is currently our only corridor where we have priority. Uh, the preemption pro uh, project that we have going on with fire rescue, it's also uh, the project is what we call CVPP, Connected Vehicle Priority and Preemption. Mm -hmm. So we're actually going to be providing preemption to fire rescue. And what we'd like to do uh, prior to the preemption, if possible, is actually provide the uh, emergency vehicles with the priority and maintain coordination because the, um, the EVP breaks coordination. So if we can flush the traffic, get the emergency vehicle through without breaking that coordination, that's a win for everybody. And the connected vehicle part, as um, I was talking about with the, um, with the Travel Safely app and the SPAT data, NBSM data. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from, from the room? Um, so regarding the co uh, coordination or cooperation between uh, the county and the city, because city of Tampa is there, right? So I was wondering, you know, Abigail talked about um, bicycle or bike network, like a bike path network. So how do you uh, coordinate with the city of Tampa on that so that the network cannot be discontinued at the boundary of Hillsborough County or the city of Tampa? Yeah, so we do share information. So there's some cities, uh, excuse me, corridors in Tampa that the county maintains. So we are in talks to uh, improve those for walking and biking. So it's about sharing information like they share with us. Hey, we're going to repave the road and uh, or this is when we'd like to schedule the repaving. And then we work together to identify 
the improvements that should go in. That's a key time when you're repaving the road to make it more like those complete streets that we talked about. So yes. Okay, any other questions? Any other questions from online audience or the students in the room? The last call. All right, maybe we can show the QR codes that people can scan again if you're interested in applying for the job. All right, um, I want to thank you both again for delivering these uh, presentations. I think it brings a lot of thoughts and information to our students. I really appreciate that. We do also have actually some professionals online join us virtually. So thank you again for doing this. Let's give another round of applause to both of my present our presenters. Thank you so much.